Man, I am so thankful for another Sunday together. Who else are happy that you're here today worshiping together? And those of you that are tuning in online, uh, it's great to have all of you as well. Thank you to Dave and the band for leading us this morning. And by the way, you don't want to cut out early because there's another song. And actually, we're going to take communion at the end together, which is going to be a really, really neat experience. And so if you're at home, make sure you're prepared for that as well. Uh, I'm excited today to jump into this new series that we've entitled, What is Really Going On? What is really going on? I want to start off by sharing with you a story. It's a true story, not a preacher's story. It's a true story uh, that took place way back in my junior year of high school. And I was out with my homies. We were cruising the streets of Bartlett while listening to the radio. And while we were just listening to the radio, the DJ came on and he immediately caught my attention. He intrigued me very deeply because he introduced a new song. And the reason why I was intrigued was because of the title of the song. Now, the title of the song was What's Up? Now, for those of you <laughs> that are from the 90s, those of you who are kids or our parents, you know why immediately I was intrigued by this title, don't you? Because that's pretty much how we spoke to everyone whenever we saw them. Isn't this true? When we would pass each other in the halls at school, we'd kind of get this half twitch, right? I think that's why we have neck pain today. Would you guys agree with this? We're keeping our chiropractors in business because of all the damage we did to our cervical, you know, and to our neck. But we would walk past each other at school and go, what's up? You know, we would, that's how we would say hey to each other. When we were at fun times, for those of you that remember fun times over here in Bartlett, where we were hanging out and doing all kinds of stuff our parents didn't want us to do, we would pass each other and meet up with each other. It was like, what's up, what's up, what's up? So everything was what's up. So these people were clever, really. Just coming out with a brand new song and entitling it, you know, what's up, they knew everybody would be intrigued. But here's the other thing that I really enjoyed about the song is that it had a really cool tune to it. And then the, the lead singer, her voice, I'm not kidding you, it was just powerful. Like this girl has a range. She could just go places that I'll never be able to go, of course, and probably many of us can't. But the name of the band was Four Non Blondes. And the song was What's Up? And the lead singer, her name was Linda Perry. Now, I know for some of you, you're already way down this path and you have the tune in your mind right now because you know that in this song, Linda Perry over and over and over again builds up, builds up, builds up to this one big question that she shouts out all through the song. And here's the question, what's going on? What's going on? Now, let me just find out. <clears throat> How many of you right now have this feeling inside of you, especially those of you that know this song, of just shouting out right now, what's going on? Anyone else? Do y'all want to do that together just for fun? Just to make sure that we're all awake and we're going down and you know, tracking together? Okay, so on the count of three, I'm going to count to three. I want you all to just, if you want to participate, okay, don't hurt yourself, but shout out what's going on. Are y'all good with this? I think I'm embarrassing my kids right here. They're <laughs> really not having this, but they haven't heard the song. If they had, if they heard the song, I'll play it for them later today, I think they will join in, okay? But let's do this. One, two, three, what's going on? There you go. All right. Y'all are awesome. So Linda Perry, basically in this song, she sings about her seemingly, I guess, 25 years of life. And over and over and over again, she just keeps looping back and looping back and looping back to this one big question that seemingly she has no answer for. And it's, what's going on? Now, I thought it'd be kind of fun for us to look at a few lines of the song. I'll start off with how she begins. She begins with this, 25 years and my life is still trying to get up that great big hill of hope for a destination. Now I'm going to jump down to the pre-chorus and here's what she goes on to say. She says, and so I cry. Sometimes when I'm lying in bed, just to get it all out, what's in my head and I, I'm feeling a little peculiar. Y'all remember that? I can't say like she does. But and so I wake in the morning and I step outside and I take a deep breath and I get real high and I scream from the top of my lungs, what's going on? Now, in the chorus, what she does, and I'm not going to sing that for you, okay? But there's just a lot of screaming what's going on between a lot of oohs. She's just going, ooh, ooh. You know, yeah, that's why I'm not going to sing for y'all. It's just a bunch of oohs with a lot of what's going on, what's going on, what's going on. And then in the second verse, she goes on and she says this. And I try. Oh, my God, do I try. I try all the time in this institution. And I pray, oh my God, do I pray. I pray every single day for revolution. And then guess what she does next? 
Yep, you guessed it. She goes back into this loop of screaming this same question, what's going on, what's going on with a bunch of ooze, and then she ends the song the way she began it. 25 years and my life is still trying to get up that great big hill of hope for a destination. Now, I know I didn't do the song justice, okay, for those of you that know the song and like it. I, I really didn't, but that's really the gist of the song. That Miss Perry, for five minutes, just goes round and round and round and round about how that she just looks at the world and she's trying and she's crying and she's praying and she's saying, what's going on? And it seems like she never finds an answer to that question. You know, for me, over the past year, a little over a year, if I'm just being real with you, uh, this song really, in many ways, speaks to where I've been. I've been trying, I've been praying, I've been crying, not a lot, but a little bit more than normal. And I have been literally asking, what's going on? Now, let me find out, have any of you been in that same camp? Yeah, I bet there's been a lot of us that have, right? Because as we've been looking out at the world around us, and all of the chaos and the crazy and the evil and the crime and the, the greed and, and the corruption and even the sickness and all these things, as we've been looking at all this, we've just been trying to get our minds around it, and it's been so unsettling and so unnerving. Because before this past year, I think if we really, really think back, if we can go back that far, if you think about the world, in many ways, the world felt kind of predictable. It, it felt somewhat safe. It felt like something that was somewhat settled. I mean, there were problems, but over the last year, if anything, it has felt like it's all been unraveling. In many ways, it looks like our world's just kind of coming apart. Up now is being called down. Down's being called up. Right's being called wrong, and wrong's being called right. And maybe some of you, if nothing else, can identify with something I've said a whole lot this past year. I can't even keep count of how often I've said it, but I stole it from the movie Zoolander. You all have seen this. And it's this statement right here. Let's look at it together. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. <laughs> have any of you thought that or felt that way this past year? I mean, even right now, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. But seriously, guys, what's going on? What's going on with our world? Why is there so much evil? Why is there so much darkness? Why are there people that spreading darkness while all the while claiming they're spreading light? Why is this happening? Well, a couple thousand years ago, Jesus actually answered this question. He was out and about doing his thing, his ministry. He was teaching. He was confronted by the Pharisees, the teachers, or the really, as he called them, the religious hypocrites of his day. And they really challenged Jesus. They said, Jesus, I mean, come on, man. You need to give us a response or an answer as to how really, at a high level, how you see God and how you see living life as a human being in God's world. And Jesus, I believe, answered this issue, this question of what's really going on in our world with one statement. I want to show you. It's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 19. He said this, For from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, slander. I'm going to read it one more time. Just make sure we're all catching on. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual immoralities, thefts, false testimonies, and slander. You see, what Jesus does is Jesus says, what's going on is that our world has one big heart problem, right? Our world has one big heart problem because our world today is filled with 7.9 billion broken, messy hearts. And Jesus was saying that what is going on in the world around you, all this stuff, this moral stuff, I'm not talking about natural evil, I'm talking about moral evil, but the moral evil, the, the destructive stuff, the selfish stuff, it's actually what's in you, coming out of you, filling the world, and every one of you are contributing to the problem of the world. Our world has a major heart problem. Now, here's the thing that Jesus knew, and this is why Jesus made this point really repeatedly throughout his teaching about the heart. Like, if you look at all the teachings of Jesus, he always gets back to the heart. You see, Jesus knew that we as human beings, by default, we really struggle with wanting to receive that the bad things that come out of us actually represent who we really are. Like, we all want to separate ourselves from the bad things. So when there's bad things that come out of us, we want to kind of dismiss it, push it away, and say, well, that doesn't represent who I really am. All the while, on the other hand, we want to take credit for all the good things that flow out of our life and say, no, no, that's who I really am. Y'all feel me? And, and y'all know this. You've seen this. If you really just think about the apologies you've seen over the years, you've seen this. Where someone says, you know, I am so sorry that I cussed you like a dog and called you all those names, but I promise you, that really wasn't my heart. Right? 
Or I am so sorry. I punched you in the face and kicked you while you're down or took your stuff. Because I promise you, I, I'm so sorry for doing it. But I, that really doesn't represent who I am. Now, I don't know how you guys respond to when you hear or see apologies like that. But for me, I just roll my eyes, nothing else internally. And I think, well, if it wasn't you, then who the heck was it? Because it sure sounded a lot like you and it looked a whole lot, lot like you. Who in the world was it? You see, in the day of Jesus, this same attitude was true. People in his day were dismissive of what was going on in here, and they wanted to focus all out here and say, the problems lie outside of me, not inside of me, and Jesus was having none of it. Jesus just kept saying to them, no, 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 no. It's in here. And here's the reason why this was so important then and it's so important today. When we dismiss what's in here, and we just kind of focus out there, which we have a tendency to do, we neglect our heart health. And what Jesus knew and what Jesus said repeatedly is that in order for our world to be healed, our hearts have to be healed. But you can't heal your heart when you don't think you have a problem. And so Jesus over and over and over again was saying, you can't neglect your heart health. That is really where the issue is. That's what's going on in our world. So with that said, what I want us to do for the rest of our time is I want for us to look at one of the most well-known teachings by Jesus where he, I believe, speaks very clearly as to what's really going on in our world today. And if you want to follow along, you can go with me, flip over to Matthew chapter 13. Uh, this teaching by Jesus is actually recorded in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But we're going to look at what Matthew said happened. And here's how it all unfolded. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And large crowds gathered around him that uh, that he got into a boat and sat down while the whole crowd stood on the shore. So Jesus goes out to have a little moment, hear the waves lapping up on the shore, and then all these people show up because... Wherever Jesus went, he drew a crowd. People wanted to watch the miracles. They wanted to listen to his words because when he spoke, he spoke with authority and power. Like there was something behind it. So they gather. Jesus gets in this boat. And then verse 3, Matthew tells us, Then he told them many things in parables or creative stories, saying, Consider the sower who went out to sow. Now let's pause here for a moment. Jesus here begins by telling a creative story, a parable, about something that really made a lot of sense to them. And this was really, you could think of as a farmer who went out to cast seed and his hope and his goal was that when he would throw seed is that all the seed would take root and then from that he would reap a big harvest. So they got that. Then Jesus goes on to describe what happened as he cast the seed. Verse 4, he says, As he sowed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it didn't have much soil. And it grew up and quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns. And the thorns came up and choked it. Still other seed fell on the good ground and produced fruit. Some a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was sown. And then right at the end, he makes the statement that oftentimes we just kind of blow through. But it's a very important statement. Verse 9. Let anyone who has ears listen. So what did Jesus mean by that last little statement? His point was, anyone that has ears, meaning all human beings, need to mull over and think through what he was just saying in this story because buried in this story was a truth about them and a truth about God that they needed to know. Now, Matthew later on, he tells us that Jesus gets around after a brief intermission to giving a detailed commentary to what he meant through this story he made up on the spot. And Matthew records for us in verse 18, Jesus offering the commentary. Here's what he says. So listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. And the one sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. But he has no root and is short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he falls away. Now, the one sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the worries of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But the one sown on the good ground, 
This is the one who hears and understands the word, who does produce fruit and yields. Some, a hundred, some sixty, some thirty times what was some. So Jesus offers this commentary. Clear as mud, right? <laughs> like, what's he talking about? Well, it's pretty evident what he's talking about. If you look at just at the end of verse 19, I'll just put up here on the screen for you. He says, what was sown in his heart. What Jesus is speaking of here really is all about the human heart. And the big idea through this teaching of the sower who's sowing seed and these four different soils that Jesus is wanting to communicate is that the impact that God has on your life has everything to do with the attitude of your heart toward him. This is the point Jesus was making really at a high level through this story. The impact that God has on your life, my life, all of us as individuals, has everything to do with the attitude of our hearts toward him. That for God to have an impact on your life, you can't have rocky, weed-infested, hard soil or heart toward God. Your heart has to be well kept. Your heart has to be soft. Your heart has to be, if you will, open toward God. And through this teaching, and really all the teachings of Jesus, he kept saying over and over again, just a very subtle and a very simple point, but one that we oftentimes forget or lose sight of. And the point he was saying is, your heart is your responsibility. Your heart is your responsibility. Let me say it one more time. Your heart is your responsibility. Jesus wanted for everyone to know that it's your responsibility as to the condition of your heart, and that will have an impact on what God does in and through your life. You see, it's not a question of whether or not God loves you. It's not a question of whether or not God wants to heal you. It's not a question of what God wants to do in your life. The question is, will you let him? Will you let him? It's your call. That's the point Jesus was making. Now, what I love and what's fascinating about this teaching is that after Jesus told the story, and in between when he actually offered his commentary, we just looked at, his disciples approached him. And in, really, in so many words, they walked up to Jesus, and you know, maybe he's getting a little sip of wine to clear his throat for the next wave, right, what he's going to teach. He had other parables. And they approached Jesus, and they said, so, Jesus, what's, what's going on? <laughs> That's really what they were asking. Like, what's going on? And they were confused or they were really curious. Jesus, why are you telling stories to these people? Why are you telling them things through parables? And I love it. In essence, what Jesus said to them is, I'm using stories about the attitude and condition of their heart because of the attitude and the condition of their heart. It's interesting when you read it, when you think about it. Jesus said, the reason why I'm telling them creative stories and parables about the attitude and condition of their heart toward God is because of the attitude and the condition of their heart toward God. That's what he said. Now, after he makes that point, he goes on and he, he does something pretty interesting. He goes back to and references a statement. And this was one that they were all good Jewish boys. Um, they knew what Jesus was saying or who he was quoting from. But he was quoting from Isaiah. And Isaiah had lived over 700 years before them. Isaiah was a prophet. He was a part of what they call, in their day, their scripture, the Old Testament. And he references back a statement that Isaiah had said and written to the people of his day, where God was speaking to Isaiah and through Isaiah for his day. And Jesus borrows that, brings it into his day, looks at his disciples and says, what Isaiah said then is true of these people right here, right now. And I want to show you what Jesus said and what he uh, quoted to them. And this is in Matthew 13 verse 14. He said, Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, you will listen and listen, but never understand. You will look and look, but never perceive. He goes on, he says, why? For this people's heart has grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes. Jesus said, it was true in Isaiah's day. It's true of these people right here. The truth of the matter is these individuals, their hearts have grown callous towards God, or you could say they hardened their hearts toward God. They've shut God out. They've closed God out. And what he's saying is, is that when you callous or harden your heart towards God, you can hear things, but not really get it. You can see things happen right in front of you, miracles and all of it, still not get it. 
And it's because of the condition of your heart. You have hardened your heart toward God. But what I love is Jesus didn't stop there, thankfully. He didn't say there's no hope for these people. They're donezo. They're so far down here, there's no hope for them. But he goes on, he finishes the quote of Isaiah, and look at what he says. He says, otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn back, and God says, and I would heal them. You see, Jesus here, in quoting Isaiah, he is saying that when it comes to God, you have two choices. But once you callous your heart towards God or harden your heart towards God, does not mean that God says, I'm done with you, there's no hope for you, that there's no options. No, there is the otherwise path. That's what Jesus is saying. There is another option. And the other option is you don't callous your heart towards God, you soften your heart towards God, you open your heart towards God, and when you do that, you will see and you will understand it, your heart will understand it, and then you will turn back to God. And what does God say he will do? He'll heal you. He wants to heal everyone. He wants to heal everyone's hearts. But I love the way Jesus wrapped up his little powwow with his buddies. I love this because he looks to them after he says that. And here's what he says to them directly. Blessed or blessed, however you want to say it, are your eyes because they do see and your ears because they do hear. Man, that is so powerful. When Jesus looked at his disciples, what he was saying to them is, you're living the blessed life. You, my friends, are living the blessed life. And the reason why is because these guys had opened their heart toward God. These guys had a soft heart towards God. They did not callous their hearts out of the four soils. They were not soil one, two, or three. They were number four. They were the good ground. And what Jesus was saying is that this 100 times, 60 times, 30 times stuff that he was speaking to, that's going to happen, and that is happening in your life. You are living the blessed life. That's what he told them. And so I believe that's exactly what's taking place and what's really going on in our world today. Our world has a heart problem because we all have heart problems. And what Jesus was saying and what I believe God wants for all of us is to soften our hearts and open our hearts to him, to invite him in, to do whatever he he wants to do in and through our hearts. But at the end of the day, guys, Jesus would look at all of us today. If he were to lock eyes with all of us in in the flesh today, but if you just listen to the Spirit, he'll tell you this. He'll say, hey, it's your choice. Do you want to live the blessed life and let God God do amazing things in your life? It's up to you. Because you and you alone have the power to soften your heart towards God and open it up or to callous it and close him out. It's your choice. But his heart and his desire is for you to soften and open your heart toward God. Now, As I have thought about just where we are today, I'm going to try to explain to you the best I can what I see, okay? And this is not just about all of you. This is about me. It's just pretty much every one of us. What the scriptures tell us regarding us in life with God is that when God created us, he created us to experience an intimate, open, loving relationship with him where we live our lives fully open, fully trusting of God and just It's all in. We're all in with God. And so ever since the beginning of time with humanity in the first rebellion, we as human beings just tend to rebel against God and say, no, I don't want that. I want to do my own thing. So what God has been doing over and over again is trying to win our hearts to him by saying, trust me, come back to me. Trust me, come back to me. Open your heart to me. I love you. And ultimately, we see that he did this by sending his son, Jesus, to tell us, but ultimately lay down his life on that cross for our sin. So this has been what God's up to the entire time. But here is what's happening today for a lot of us. A lot of us, when we think about where we are in this relationship with God, we feel like God is distant. We feel like, you know, maybe there's no passion. We feel apathetic towards God. We have all these different words we would describe to say, this is how God feels, you know, in my life, my relationship with him. And yet, when we really start thinking about some of the reasons we offer, or at least the reasons we contemplate as to why that's the case, here's where we generally go. Well, it's my dang kids. You know, it's it's their fault. I mean, they're stressing me out, and they're, they're just horrible kids. And, you know, I just can't with God. I just can't, you know, whatever. Or it's my spouse. Or it's my boss. Or I'm too dang busy. I don't have time. Or my kids' activities are running me ragged. Or, I mean, you know, 
And so what do we do? We tend to blame circumstances or other people for where we are in our relationship with God. That's what we do. What are we doing? We're focusing out here, right? We're just going, oh, no, no, it, it, it can't be me. It's got to be it's got to be someone or something else that's causing this. We blame pastors. We blame churches. They don't offer the right programs. Their preaching's not deep enough. The worship's not whatever. I mean, I hear this stuff all the time. And yes, I roll my eyes. Okay, I do, admittedly. But here's the thing. At the end of the day, it's your heart and God's heart. It's your heart and God's heart. No one else is interfering with that. That is your decision, your choice. As I thought about how crazy this is, I was thinking about just my closest relationship here in the flesh on this earth with my beautiful bride, Melissa. Melissa and I have been married almost 23 years, okay, this year. Got married in 98. Uh, she's an amazing girl. Love her. Um, very grateful for her. But I started just thinking, okay, what if Melissa and I, over the past 30 days or 60 days or whatever, got to this rough patch to where... I just, it just wasn't clicking. You know, like, I was bored with her. Um, I know I'm going to step on some toes. Some of y'all probably feel this way right now. But anyway, <laughs> this is not a marriage message, I promise. But you just hang with me, okay? I'm sorry. But it was, I was bored with her. We didn't connect. We felt distant, on and on and on and on and on. And finally, we get to the point where we go to a counselor. And we sit down with a counselor, and the counselor listens to us. And they say, Jonathan, tell me how you feel, you know, and... I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm bored with her, and she's this and that and this and that. The, the intimacy's gone, the intimacy's gone, the fire's gone, the passion's gone, and all this. And, and at the end, if the counselor looked at me and they just said, okay, so what do you think are the reasons for that? I mean, why do you think this is going on in your marriage? And I were to say, um, my job, pandemic, uh, financial stress, my kids, my parents, my parent, mother and father-in-law, my brothers. I mean, I just started like, if this counselor had any sort of brain, at the end of listening to me, I mean, because they would be kind about it, like, oh my gosh, hurry up, dude. At the end of it, what would they say to me? Jonathan, with all due respect, have you lost your mind? Because here's the truth. It's about your heart and Melissa's heart. And all you have control over is your heart. She has control over her heart. And no one or nothing out here, circumstantial or other people, have the power to take away your choices to what you do with your heart for her. And the same is true for her. And they would say, you need to work on you. You need to work on what's in here. And she would, of course, tell Melissa the same thing, whatever issue she had. Well, if you bring that to where we are with God, thankfully, the God who created us, his heart is completely wide open and full of love for all of us. There is no, like, God has retreated, God is closing us out, God is saying, you got to do things for me to kind of move in your direction. No, God has already moved in our direction, and he's wide open. The problem between where we are with God and this lack of intimacy, this lack of joy, this lack of closeness has everything to do with our hearts. And it's not until we start dealing with this in here that it's going to change. If you keep blaming circumstances and other people for where you are in your relationship with God, nothing will change for you. You can change all the different environments. You can change a lot of circumstantial things. You can do all those types of things, bounce churches, whatever you want to do. But at the end of the day, if you don't open your heart to God and soften your heart to God and say, God, I want you more than I want anything, you're just playing spiritual games, guys. And that was the point Jesus made in his day to the religious, and I'm telling you today, I see this all the time. Not only do I see it outwardly, I see it in the mirror when I look at myself. And so that's what God's been teaching me is, Jonathan, you're responsible for your heart. You want to live the life of blessing? Open it to me. You want to keep living this life where you're, you're just looking outwardly? Keep doing what you're doing. But you're going to miss out on what I want to do and what I can give you. So today, what I believe we all need it's just a moment to reflect on God's love for us. And I want us to do it in a tangible way. As I said earlier, through just taking communion. And before we take communion together, I want to share with you a verse that I read a couple weeks ago that God really used in my heart um, to connect with me deeply. And Paul wrote this in his letter to the church at Galatia. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, uh, Paul wrote these words. He says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God 
who loved me and gave himself for me. And I love those words because what Paul was doing in this letter, he was reflecting on Jesus. And he was reflecting on Jesus is the one who loved him and willingly laid down his life for him or gave his life for Paul. And Paul said, as I take this in, then the way that I respond is, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live in faith in the Son of God. So what was Paul saying? He was saying, when I really reflect on Jesus and what he's done for me and the love of God for me, and I really soak that in, then my response to that, my heart is to say, God, here is all of my life. I'm going to open my heart as wide as I can to you. I'm going to soften my heart to, to you. And everything I do, I want my life to just be yours. Every ounce of it. That's what Paul said. Friends, if you're here and you have received the Spirit of God by giving your life to Jesus, the Spirit inside of you right now is telling you that what Paul wrote and what I'm sharing with you today, it is true. You know it in here because the Spirit's telling you this. It's the truth of God. And what the Spirit wants for you to do is to just to take that truth to heart, open your heart to God and respond and say, God, here's my life. All of it. If you're here this morning, though, maybe you've been in church a lot, maybe you've prayed one of these prayers before to invite Jesus into your heart or however all that was presented to you. And if you're just real about it, you say, man, Jonathan, I'll be honest. I, I've never really felt a connection with God throughout my entire life of what I believe is being a Christian. And you're confused by that. I get that because you're listening to a guy that really didn't become a follower of Jesus, like receive the spirit until I was 20 years of age. And I grew up as a pastor's kid in a preacher's home, invited Jesus into my heart, went, rocked the aisle, got, got baptized at a young age. But it wasn't really until I was 20 that I saw that my heart had been callous towards God, not really open to God. And at the age of 20, my heart opened to God because I saw Jesus and his love for me. I received Jesus or gave my life to him. And the spirit came in me and my life's never been the same. Hadn't been perfect, but it's never been the same. And if that's where you're at, there's no shame in that. But I would invite you, if the Spirit is speaking to you today, just open your heart and say, God, I want all of you. Here's my life. And give your life to him.